I'm still wondering why you're laughing. The children are too many or their names are interesting. <laughs> My husband was saying, why don't we add one so that we have a perfect number? And our elder do- eldest daughter was saying, if you add, I am leaving this house. <laughs> so, let God's will be done. I think she feels she's old enough to almost get married. So she's wondering she'll be giving birth. The mother is also giving birth. We thank God for the blessings. The word of the Lord says children are a blessing from the Lord. They're like arrows in a man's hand. Happy is a man whose quiver is full. So it depends on the size of your quiver. Our quiver is slightly big. (laughs) Thank you, choir. You've sung with power, with beauty, and with pathos. May the Lord bless you. I am grateful for our children. May you grow up in the Lord. Every one of us is a stone that forms the temple of the Lord. You all need to find your space, fit in so well, and serve the Lord and serve humanity. You have something to do. Allow me to pray. Heavenly Father, the hour has come to glorify yourself. We pray that you will sanctify each one of us so that your presence will not consume us. I am here to speak for you and speak of you. Pull every form of human wisdom from me and give me a word in season to be able to break the bread of life. May we be re-energized May we be refreshed. May we find healing physically and spiritually. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I had promised that today I will try and unpack Jeremiah 6.16, which has been our kivas throughout the week. Our theme being stand, see, ask, and walk. Society has come to a point where we say, my salt is your sugar. My sugar is your salt. Truth has ceased to be absolute. Truth means anything. It is relative. Everyone has their own standard of morality. Everyone. If I look for the church in the world, I will not find it. But if I look for the world in the church, it is so conspicuous. But the complacency in the church does not permit you to question anything. It is see no evil. Hear no evil. Speak no evil. We are saved by grace alone. Do not judge me. Every man does whatever is right in his own eyes. Sinners multiplied in the house of the Lord. Because we are not required to speak but keep quiet. There is a cry for accommodation. There is a cry for sensitivity. There is a cry for tolerance. There is a cry for dynamism. There is confusion all over. Life has become so entangled. Life has become so dark. So twisted. So complicated. And so messy. 
we are insisting on a certain path that continues to plunge us into ruin. Our sermons, our messages, our songs are of Zion, but our character are Babylonish. The will of God, the standards of God, the demands of God have been labeled ideal to mean they are unreasonable. They exist only in the imagination, but can never become a reality. We have lost confidence in the things of God. We have such a strong love for the world and the things of the world that pass away. Every fiber of our being is laced with ideologies and philosophies and perceptions of the world. All this, unfortunately, are happening when the blessed hope of his appearing is at the door. A songwriter says, yes, even at the door. The sons of Issachar had understanding of the times. And they knew what Israel ought to do. But modern Israel has no understanding of the times. And so do not know what to do because of willful ignorance. Not just ignorance, it is willful ignorance when they are the depositories of so much truth and so much light. God created us in his own image and likeness. But at no point did he place us beyond the trials and temptations of this world. He said, in the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the what? The world. It means that amidst the tribulation we are going through, we should not compromise the standards of God. But learn to focus on him who's the author and finisher of our faith. Praise the Lord. The pain, the sorrow, the misery that we see in our marriages and families. Like I have indicated from the time we began. Is simply because we have betrayed the secret of our success. And if we must progress, if we must prosper, if we must thrive, then we must go back to God and find out what was his plan from the beginning. We all want rest for our souls. And if that be the case, then Jeremiah is saying, we must stand in the ways. And see, and ask for the old paths where the good way is. And walk in it. Then we will find rest for our souls. I was trying to imagine a little bit what he means by stand. Amidst the, the confusion that we are in, he's saying, stand, stop, halt. The path you have chosen yields no real benefit, if anything. It will consume you. If you're not sure of the path you have taken and all you reap is confusion and disorientation and you're filled with so much emptiness, do, your favor, do yourself a favor and do what? Stop. Do 
we have a concept in our home taught to us by my husband that if it is not getting anywhere interesting and all it does is sap energy out of us just take a break and tie a knot on that rope tie a knot and hold on right there it could be a financial knot you have to tie could be a marital knot could be a health knot could be a parenting knot an academic knot what we are saying take a break avoid quick fixes This reminds me I heard attended a function for my nephew who had been enrolled in a rehab and the rehab says uh, everyone who comes here must have a pastor that supports so quickly my sister in law thought I have a kamati you know what kamati is when you all of you are kisses, why is all of you saying, hmm? <laughs> I have a Kamati who's a pastor, so she writes my name there, and it's time to graduate, and they say the pastor must be here, so I went. There's this professor who was once a beneficiary from this rehab. Every time they have a graduation, he comes to give his testimony. So we are listening carefully. This is a professor, renowned professor who has taught some of our best and chief economists in this country. Got into drinking, became an alcoholic. Struggled with it to the point it now affected his marriage and family. The wife was unable to tie a knot and hold on right there. She jumped out, so I cannot stay with an alcoholic. The university was unwilling to let him go because he was the best. So the university said, let us try help him. If it fails, then we can let him go. So the university is the one that enrolled him in that rehab. And this God we serve, whose eyes can locate each one of us in our suffering, made a special visitation. I don't know what happened in the rehab, but it's a living testimony of one who has overcome alcoholism. But where is his wife? As he speaks, he says, I didn't know alcohol can rob you of your family. My wife left me, is now married as a third wife to another family. I'm out here. I am free. I am better. I have no family to go back to. Children of God, we are saying when it gets thick, don't be too fast. Tie a knot. Hold on right there. And I've seen many marriages of people who have walked out. And today they regret. When you see the professor now helped, back to work, bouncing with life, you wish you knew. But how do you want to come back? When he needed you most. I'm 
Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe. Maybe not. Jeremiah says, when you stand, you stand and see. Once you halt, have time to reflect. Where am I coming from? Where am I at the moment? How did I even get here? What did I miss? Where am I headed? Is this the path I was meant to walk in? Or have missed the path? Don't just move blindly because the majority are going that direction. Saying, take a break, look around. This switch I'm about to do, is it worth it? Some of us have been so selfish that we don't even care that we have children. It's about me. It's about him. We don't care about our children. I meet this girl and she tells me, Pastor, we began dating in campus. And in the course of the week, I said, campus students have no business dating, okay? Yeah. We'll preach that message. I'm sorry. We have dinner with Lovington AYS. Youth. It's not too late to sign up. It's 2,900 at Park Inn in Westlands. You must sign up by force, okay? Yes. Because that message is meant for you. So they met in campus. They dated seven years. And I keep on asking, what is this thing people are dating for? For more than two, three years. What do you want to find out? Probably it's too long because you started too early. And there are few things you have to achieve before you get married. But there's danger in dating too long. Chances are you mess up on the way and you might not even wed in the first place. Because familiarity breeds contempt. So she says, along the way, pastor, I don't know what happened. I conceived. Those are the dangers of dating too long. I think it's your brother you're dating. So they have this daughter. She says, for these seven years, he never proposed marriage. So when I got pregnant... He quickly rushed to introduce me to his parents. His parents were against our marriage. But we insisted and we moved in to cohabit. We have been staying together, but it's not working out. It's not working out. So they have processed a separation. They have gone separate ways. And all of them have legal minds, so you know the profession I'm talking about, okay? Both of them. If they want to move a cup from the kitchen to, to the sitting room, it must have some legal perspective to it. <laughs> One time a friend of mine wanted to get married and she says, Pastor, I'm a lawyer. But when I see the families of lawyers, they're either separated or divorced. I said, that you can have a beautiful family. You only don't need to carry the judiciary into your house. <laughs> the way we keep sitting with every meeting we have with her, we are just having fun as girls. He must give every discussion a legal perspective. And I keep on telling, come on, you will not reason like this with a man in the house. In the house, you are a mother, you are a wife. Even in my very own house, I am not a pastor. Though my husband calls me a pastor because he believes I am his pastor. I am not. A 
I'm a mother. My children call me mommy. They don't call me Pastor Mukoro. The pastor thing we will live here. Once we leave this building here, we will leave the pastor say. Once we get home, you are a mother, you are a wife. And she says, okay, I'll try get into it quickly. She gets married. The next time I meet after a few years, she has two children. They went separate ways. They couldn't stay. And at times I ask, when we are making these decisions, do we have our children in mind? And she says, my husband filed for custody of the child. I didn't want to get into that whole struggle. So I allowed him to have the child. But when the child is there, he's telling the father, when is mommy coming to stay with us? When the child comes to visit mommy, when is daddy coming to stay with us? Pastor, tell me a way we can reunite with my husband. I am saying when it gets thick, tie a knot. Hold on right there. I have no help, but our help comes from above. Doesn't matter how it's twisted, how dirty it is, filthy. The Lord knows how to polish it. I've always said, no one is too broken for the carpenter of Nazareth to repair. And when he does his repair, the product is better than the original. He says, ask for the old parts, where the good way is. No one has it all together. You agree with me? No one. Jacob had two women he loved. Forget about the house girls. Two women he loved. No, one. It was one. The other one he was deceived. Yeah. There was Rachel that was very beautiful, who was younger than the sister. But you see, Rachel, the Lord denied him the fruit of the womb. And there was Leah, who was not so good looking, because she was a squint. These people who you think they're looking up, when you ask them, why are you not looking at me? They say, but I'm seeing you. <laughs> she was a squint. But even with that, the Lord blessed her. With what? I'm saying no one has it all. No one. Kila mutu wako na kasoro yake. Kila mutu. Ata elder number one. Elder number one nani yapo? Ata pastor. Kila mutu wako na kasoro yake. No one has it all. What we need to ask is what was God's original plan? Because therein lies the secret of our success. He has not changed the path because he changes not. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will never change. He says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. And God is not going to excuse our willful ignorance. We will continue to suffer. Get me right? We will continue to perish. We will continue to suffer until the day we purpose to deliberately and intentionally know his will. You must seek it. He says, seek and you will do what? Fine. And then it says, walk in it. Once you find the good way, walk in it. But many of us have found the good way and have looked at it with a twisted nose and said, this is not for me. I'm way above this one. Then why were you asking? Why were you looking for the good ways? Like going to the doctor and the doctor tells you this is the problem, gives you a prescription. You go buy drugs and then you say, I'm not taking drugs. So why were you going to see the doctor in the first place? Why 
walk in it. It is not enough to know God's will. We must purpose to do his will. Because you can never, never go wrong with God. Never. The word of the Lord says, In the way of righteousness is life. And in the pathway thereof, there is no death. You can never go wrong with the Lord. Never. Israel's response was, We will not walk in it. That was their response. Oh yes, we have found the good way, but we are not going to walk in it. Does that sound like Adventism? Oh yeah. It was yesterday we were having this conversation when we were driving home about homeschooling. We had paid a visit with my husband to a school somewhere in Siokimao. Just on a fact-finding mission. And we were amazed. The owner of the school is not an Adventist. But he's operating the school on Adventist principle. The school is far way better than what we call our Adventist schools. This is someone who's just picked probably our book education and has decided this is the way I am going to do what? Walk in it. And is running a purely Bible-based, Christ-centered curriculum. And I said, what is wrong with us? She has a program for men and women. What was that book, Daddy? Man Enough. They have a book called, a program called Man Enough and Woman Enough that our Seventh-day Adventist churches have adopted to mentor young women. And the young men, it's as if we have nothing in our depositories. These are individuals that have gone to our bookshop, just pulled out this good book by Ellen White. They have read cover to cover and they've been convicted and they've said, I'm going to walk in this. But you and I here, mm. say, <laughs> so walk in it. You can never go wrong with God. Israel's response was we will not walk in it. A response that only invites God's judgments upon us. We have done everything contrary to his will. We saw the wind, we are now reaping a whirlwind. We cannot enjoy the joy and happiness that comes with marriage and family. Instead, they strife and antagony. Because Adventists want to run their marriages like the world runs its marriage. I'm tired of seeing young girls having to, 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 to sap every cent from our young boys because they've seen some funny wedding on social media. He must propose to me this night at Parkin in the presence of everyone. And the guy has to organize photo men and all that just for you to have some photos to come and put on your status and on Facebook. And everyone say, beautiful, nice. Congratulations. It makes you feel happy because you want validation. Let me tell you, when you believe in a course, whether you have how many likes and dislikes, move forward. I don't need your validation. I don't need you to tell me I look good. I looked at the mirror at Mary's house today. There's a mirror in the room. I sleep. And I looked at myself. I said, Lisa, you look good. Your opinion is second. I don't care. Whether you think I'm looking good or not, it's up to you. 
The problem is you must deal with it. Christ declares that the condition of the world will be as in the days before the flood and as in Sodom and Gomorrah. Clearly told us. But I see the antediluvians, the beings that stayed before the flood, created new paths which were perfected by the post-diluvians. Everything we need to know about life had a beginning in the beginning in Aden. But they reached some point and they looked at the women in church and they said, Pastor, I've looked around, there's no one to marry. Yeah. Are these guys married? Not yet. The way they were calling starting like this, are you saying they're not marriageable? Some guys say, there are no women in church. And the sons of God went and married the daughters of men. And the end result was such a wickedness that made God regret he ever created man and had to destroy the earth with flood. And even after that baptism and salvation, the few ate that came out of the flood began to multiply. And as it began to multiply, there was apostasy with them, some of them. They split. Those that split, that didn't love God, went to dwell in the plains where they built the Tower of Babel, the cities, and perfected the new parts that were devised by man. Perfected. Perfected. The first time, God destroyed the ungodly with the flood and only eight were saved. The second time, he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah with brimstone and fire and only three were saved out of mercy. Sodom and Gomorrah foreshadows the final destruction of the world with fire and brimstone. Allow me to ask you a question. Between burning and the fire that burns, which one is eternal? Between burning, Sodom was burning. Between that burning and the fire that burnt it, which one is eternal? Did I confuse you? With all these PhDs you have? <laughs> Sodom was burning. Between that burning that was going on and the fire that burnt it, which one was eternal? Love it. The fire that burnt it was eternal. Allow me to say that Sodom that was burning was burnt to ashes. We agree. But the fire that burnt it is still there to death. It is eternal. It is still burning. Go with me to Jude. Jude is the, the book just before Revelation. Jude 1 verse 7. It's only one chapter. 7 says, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example to us. Suffering the vengeance of what? Eternal what? Fire. It is the fire that is eternal. Why? This fire is still burning because it does not depend on what is being burnt. And so Sodom was 
consumed but the fire is still there to date then the question begs what is this fire the book is hebrews hebrews this is the problem of not putting bookmarks in the verses you want to read you waste people's time time 12 hebrews chapter 12 what is this fire hebrews 12 28 be in the habit of carrying your bible stop depending on these projections carry your bible to church hebrews 12 28 29 The Bible says wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear for our God is a consuming what fire So why do we conclude that the fire is eternal it is because God is a consuming fire And this same God is eternal. It follows therefore that the fire is also what? Eternal. Another question I would want to ask. Between the wicked and the righteous, who will be in the fire forever? Huh? Now this is how people fail exams. Between the wicked and the righteous who will be in the fire forever thank you the righteous how do i know isaiah chapter 33 isaiah 33 verse 14 and 15 listen carefully it's beautiful the sinners in zion are afraid fearfulness hath surprised the hypocrites who among us shall dwell with the what with the what with the devouring fire who among us the sinners in Zion are fearful who among us here shall dwell with the devouring fire who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings listen to the answer he that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly he that despiseth the gain of oppressions that shaketh his hands from holding of bribes that stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood and shuteth his eyes from seeing evil praise the lord it is the righteous that shall dwell in the everlasting fire and it is because they would have developed fireproof character you're only able to dwell in the everlasting fire if you have developed fireproof Hananiah if you remember Mishael Azaria could not be consumed in the fire because they were in the fire that consumes all fires I couldn't eternal fire could not consume them because they had developed fireproof Allow me say that crisis does not develop character. Crisis reveals character. It is when life paints you into a corner is when you will know this faith you have been seeing faith of our fathers only faith we will be true to the till end it's until you're painted to a corner 
then the lord will prove to you, prove to you 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 will not be true to the end to the end you will not you can so crisis moments reveal our character children of god our big brother the eternal fire is coming will you be able to dwell with the fire or the fire will consume you have you built fireproof character or not have you built fireproof character for your children or not if not jeremiah is saying stand in the ways and say saying ask for the old parts where the good way is and walk in it then you will find rest for your souls how many people are saying lord i need you to help me build a fireproof character how many people let me see by the show ones i love the song that we have been singing One stanza says may every heart receive his loving spirit and know the truth that makes life truly free then in that spirit we may live united and find in God our deep security may the lord jesus bless us in his mighty name I will ask the choristers to help us sing that song. And then we will rise as Pastor Akali comes to pray with us that Lord help us build a fireproof characters. Let us all rise. Six five four.
Thank you, Pastor, for this message. Shall we pray? Loving Father, in the name of Jesus, we can't thank you enough. We thank you for the blessings of this week. We praise your name, dear Lord, that you set aside this week for the families and homes. Thank you for calling us back to the old path. We have been gone too long in the wrong direction. Your word has told us to stop, to stand and see and ask for the old path and follow. Help us not to negotiate on this matter, but to follow your old path. For therein lies the security of our homes, the blissfulness of our homes, the joy of our homes. As human beings, we, in our fallen state, love things many times that are opposed to your will. We pray that you give us the grace that we will not continue to go opposite to your instructions, but we will willingly follow your instructions, for therein is our safety. The joy that you ordain for the homes and for the families is in your word, it is in your path, it is in your direction. Help us to follow that direction. We praise your name and pray, Lord, that this word that has been our portion this week will remain to be a blessing to all the homes here represented. And many of the homes of your children who will find time to hear and follow with this word that remains online. Loving Father, we pray that all said and done, that we will not just remain homes and families, but we will be part and parcel of your eternal family. For trained in your way, we will be able to stand the eternal fire. May this be our experience. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.